preacher one day delivered his sermon with such fire and gusto that it almost made the rafters shake. He was preaching from John the Baptist. He said, also now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. And the hearers that day said to him, we would have thought that you would have been preaching to hardened criminals, people who were in jail. This is a sermon for the jailhouse. Oh no, said the good man. If I were preaching in the jail, I would have used this text, which says, Jesus Christ came to the world to save sinners. And I would, and I would have quoted John 3.16 if I was in the jailhouse preaching. No, the text that lays the ax to the tree is for the self-righteous, to humble Laodicean pride. Wow. That's what John was doing down there at the river, right? He was preaching repentance to the people that came. The gospel is for the lost to remove their despair. So if today you feel lost, if you feel discouraged, if you feel that way, this sermon today is for you. If you're not lost, you have no need of a savior, right? The question, would the shepherd go after sheep that didn't get lost? Or why would a woman sweep her house for little bits of coins, little bits of money, if the coins were still in her purse? No, medicine is for the disease. And so this morning, I wanna talk about some things that uh, maybe we haven't thought about for a little while. And our great need on this day of atonement, since 1844, we believe that, don't we? Day of Atonement is to heal the pride of Laodicea. That's what, that's what this message is for. That's what this judgment hour is for. You know, Laodicea, the word means judging of the people or a people who are judged. Laodicea is that last church in Revelation chapter 3, which talks about uh, being zealous, therefore, and repent. That's uh, Revelation 3, verse 19. Now, in the Old Testament, Leviticus 16 is the Day of Atonement chapter. Located in the very center of the book of Leviticus. You can prove this to yourself sometime by just taking the book of Leviticus and turn to chapter 16 and have the first chapter and the, and the last chapter of Leviticus and, and see the, the thickness of the, of the leaves that are between it. Leviticus 16 is right in the heart of the chapter, right in the middle. And uh, that's uh, pretty important because uh, it's the Day of Atonement chapter in the Old Testament. It was known as Yom Kippur. It was the holiest day of the year during which the holiest person in Israel, the high priest, went into the holiest place on earth, which was the most holy place of heaven's sanctuary, to perform the holiest work of all, the cleansing of the sanctuary. It was judgment day for Israel, preceded by the blowing of trumpets for more than a week. All this is at the apex, the very center of the first five books of the Bible. Leviticus is in the center. And chapter 16 is in the center of the first five books of the Bible. It's almost like it's an apex. Interesting thing, I'm almost to the page in the center of the first five books of the Bible. It's the focus of the books of Moses. And all this pointed to the final day of atonement, the day in which we live today, since 1844, until the close of human probation almost as if the apex points to the heavenly places where the holiest person of salvation history goes into the holiest place in all the universe to do the holiest work of all eternity to get us ready to meet the Lord in the air. Now that's the goal, isn't it? The Bible just moves toward that one point when Jesus will come in the clouds of heaven. It's an amazing thing. Like the Old Testament moves toward one point, the coming of our Redeemer the first time, and the New Testament moves toward that point when Jesus will come again. And we have the privilege of teaching this message to 
the world, the everlasting gospel, in the framework of the judgment hour in which we live. Actually, it's in the first angel's message. The hour of his judgment has come. When we read that and proclaim that and teach that, we're saying that the day of his judgment is come. It's here now. And uh, the whole Bible moves really literally to that point. In Leviticus, <clears throat> we talked about Leviticus 16, that day of atonement chapter. In Leviticus, the, Leviticus, the blood of, hum, of animal sacrifices points to Christ's death as our substitute. The lamb, the substitute, the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. And this builds from the daily sacrifices all year long and ending on the day of atonement, which was called the yearly, when the high priest would go into the most holy place. On the day of atonement, which was the 10th day of the seventh month, a special sacrifice. And at the end of the day, Israel was separated from her sins and her sins were placed on the head of a live goat who was then led out into the wilderness and presumably uh, perished out there, uh, maybe from a wild animal or something like that, bearing the sins of Israel from a sanctuary that was now cleansed. And as this was going on, they celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles, which was a celebration of their first day in Canaan land. They hadn't gotten there yet, but they were celebrating it already, called the Feast of Tabernacles. The blood of that day was the basis of atonement and acquittal. And the people were declared righteous. The first, five chap first 16 chapters of the book of Leviticus are about uh, cleansing by blood. The first 16 chapters. The rest of the chapter, from 16 and onward, the, the, the other half of this book, uh, is, a, is a presentation of a call to holiness and sanctification. Those two go together, right? Cleansing and sanctification. Uh, justification and sanctification. The book is divided that way. It's an interesting idea. Leviticus 23, now we've been talking about Leviticus 16, but Leviticus chapter 23 is a companion chapter for, for, for the 16th chapter. These two chapters, chapter 16 and chapter 23, I hope you'll read those this afternoon. It's a good read, a good Sabbath afternoon read. These two chapters answer many of the questions we have about how we can prepare and approach, approach God as Jesus does a finishing work in the heavenly sanctuary. What happened on the Day of Atonement was forward-looking to the time when Jesus would enter the most holy place of heaven's sanctuary. For us, preparatory for his coming to this earth again in power and glory. Interesting text in uh, Hebrews, it says that what he's doing there, he's doing for who? For us. This is all for us. The one who never slumbers or sleeps. The one to whom, to whom we can pray is always there on our behalf. So today I want to examine five things. Five activities that are called for on this Day of Atonement, this antitypical Day of Atonement in which we now live. The first angel calls it the hour of God's judgment because the Day of Atonement was a day of judgment. All those who were disinterested and had nothing to do with it, uh, they were separated from the people. It was a day of judgment. In fact, in the Jewish encyclopedia, says, it says that the Day of Atonement is the Day of Judgment. I'd like to have us turn to Leviticus 23 now, verse 27. The first of five things that are called for on this Day of Atonement. Leviticus 23, verse 37. If you'll turn with me. I always like it because there's so many Bibles in this chapel when we meet on Sabbath morning. Leviticus 23, verse 27. <clears throat> Here's what it says. Also on the tenth on the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. Remember, day of judgment. It shall be a holy convocation unto you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. 
The first of these five things that I'm going to talk about today that prepares for the second coming of Jesus is a holy convocation. It's like a camp meeting, if you will. All the people of, of, of Judah were called down to Jerusalem. All the people of Israel, literally, earlier on, were called down to Jerusalem. I was reading Leslie Harding about this, uh, this call that the trumpets blew for 10 days before the Day of Atonement. And the trumpet would blow in Jerusalem. And then over on another hill nearby, another person would be with another trumpet, and he would blow his trumpet when he hears the first one, and the third one, and the fourth one, different places in the land of Israel. And the trumpets blew throughout the land. And what were they blowing for? They were calling the people down to Jerusalem for a holy convocation, for a camp meeting. They all gathered around the sanctuary, around the temple later on, when they actually got to Canaan. So verse 27 again. On the tenth day of the seventh, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Gather at the sanctuary. Sanctuary was the focus of all the religion in the land of Israel in the ancient times. Why focus on the sanctuary in the end time? Because that's where Jesus is, right? And if we understand things right, in every part of that sanctuary, it was a symbol of him. For instance, there was a door, right? What did Jesus say about himself and his work? I'm the door. Uh, he's the bread of life, he said. And there was bread in the sanctuary. And he's the light of the world. And there was lights in the sanctuary. He's the sweet-smelling savor in Ephesians 5, 2. As the incense ascended, he is the sweet-smelling savor. So all of these things in the sanctuary were commemorative of him. They represented him. That's why we should focus on the sanctuary, because when we do, we focus on Jesus, because he is the sanctuary. Well, Jesus is in the sanctuary, and indeed, he is the sanctuary, and the focus of our attention in this pre-Advent judgment hour is upon him. In fact, when John, in chapter 5 of Revelation, saw a view into the most holy place of the heaven sanctuary, Actually, chapters 4 and 5 of, of Revelation are about the judgment hour. And John sees in chapter 5 a lamb in the midst of the throne as though he had been freshly slain. This is all Christ-centered, isn't it? A cross in the most holy place in the end of time? Uh, this can be only because he ministers with his own blood. Uh, it's an amazing thought to think and every part a symbol of him. Gather at the sanctuary for a holy conv convocation, for a camp meeting, as you see all the tribes gathered around the, around the sanctuary for the Day of Atonement. That's how, how we come to Jesus in our time. By faith, we enter there. In fact, it says in Ephesians 2, verse 6, that we, are, that we can sit with him in heavenly places. Now, I'm not there physically right now, and you're not there physically, but by faith, we can have that wonderful privilege of sitting with him in heavenly places in a spiritual way. Every day, as we open the word and we pray, we have that kind of an audience from the king of heaven, with the king of heaven. We have the privilege of coming by faith to the heavenly sanctuary where Jesus is, our great high priest. I'd like to have us turn to a few passages in Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is a book that is all about the sanctuary, as is another Testament, New Testament book, the book of Revelation. But Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Hebrews 8, verses 1 and 2. If you ask the average person where Jesus is today, they might not have an answer for you, a very good answer. But we know where he is, right? Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. It says, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. What he's going to do now is summarize the first seven chapters in the book of Hebrews. This is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. And then back a couple of pages to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. 
Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he, what is the next word? Ever liveth. Seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for us, for them. Another one, Hebrews 10, 19 and 20. Hebrews 10, 19 and 20. Having therefore, brethren, that's us, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. That middle wall of partition has been broken down. He is the veil now in the heavenly sanctuary. That veil in the earthly temple was rent when Jesus dies on the cross and says it's finished, right? But he is the veil. We have connection with the king of heaven right there in the throne room, and he's our high priest right now. Let's turn back a few pages to Hebrews chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. It's easy to remember. The one we read was 10, 19, and 20. This is 6, 19, and 20. Hebrews 6, 19, and 20. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth into that within the veil. And he is the veil, right? Whither the forerunner of our, of, is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. It's a call to turn away from ourselves to the living God, to Jesus. It's directional. Looking up, Jesus once said, when you see all these awful things coming down on the earth, what should we do? Lift up our heads and look upward to that place where Jesus is. That's, the sanctuary is the anchor of our soul. He is the anchor of our soul. Looking to Jesus, the forerunner, the focus is on him and his work for us. Hebrews 9.24 says that all of his work is for us. And now is the time for riveting our minds upon present truth as it is in Jesus as we prepare for his second coming and as we prepare for heaven. I want to read a couple of uh, quotations from Spirit of Prophecy. This one is Life Sketches, page 278. God's people are now to have their eyes fixed on the, what, she, what do you think it says? The heavenly sanctuary, where the final ministration of our great high priest is the work of judgment going forward where he is interceding for his people. And another one, Spirit of Prophecy, page 313, the subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. Why should we clearly understand it? Because it's going on now, right? When we approach God, that's where he is at this very moment. All need a knowledge for themselves of the position and work of our great high priest, Otherwise, it will be un impossible for them to exercise the faith essential at this time or to occupy the position which God has designed them to fill. So we want faith. The object of our faith is Jesus, and that's where he is. The work of Christ on the cross, his sacrifice, and his ministry in the sanctuary as priest is the foundation of our faith, especially in these end times. One is dependent on the other. Both are crucial to our readiness for heaven. He's both sacrifice and priest, and also he is our great representative. Aren't you glad we have a representative that's in heaven? <laughs> in earthly governments, we have representatives, right? They're in the Congress. But we, who have our citizenship, a dual citizenship, one in heaven, Jesus is our representative there. And he does his work in front of all the angels. He's as transparent as the sunlight. He, lets us, he makes us privy to all of these things in his word. Ministering the benefits of his work on the cross, he's our representative on the throne of heaven. That's the first one, a holy convocation, meeting around the sanctuary and, and, and thinking about what our high priest is doing. That's the first one, camp meeting, if you will. Secondly, for our preparation for the second coming, let's go back to 
Leviticus 23, 27 again. Remember, this is the Day of Atonement chapter, along with Leviticus 16. Leviticus 23, verse 27. <clears throat> Pages of my Bible aren't separating like they should. Also, on the 10th day of the seventh month, what happened on the 10th day of the seventh month? Day of Atonement, right? There shall be a Day of Atonement. It shall be a holy convocation, camp meeting. First one we talked about. And you shall afflict your souls. That's the second thing that's mentioned in that. We are asked, at, we are asked to identify with an offering. Well, wait a minute here. Let me, let me read the rest of the text. I didn't read it all. And offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Okay. We'll come to the other one later. We are asked to identify with an offering made by fire unto the Lord. What's that all about? What's that all about on the Day of Atonement? Anciently, the sacrifice was consumed by fire upon a brazen altar out in the court of the sanctuary. Jesus was made sin for us, it says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, 21. And he wants to prepare us for heaven by the sacrifice of who? Ourselves. That's how we're made ready, right? The sacrifice of ourselves. Now, he made readiness for us because he sacrificed his life. But uh, you know when it says that he carried that cross, whose cross really was that? He took that cross, but he, didn't, he wasn't responsible for it, was he? That cross is, was, is really our cross. And then it says in Matthew, if any man will follow after me, let him take up whose cross? His cross, my cross, and follow him. And where, did that, where, where will that lead us if we'll follow him there? A place called Golgotha, right? Where Calvary is. That's where it leads us. It leads us to a death to our old sinful selves and the new birth takes place, right? The sacrifice of ourselves. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. We're familiar with these verses, I think. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Paul talks about this. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a, what kind of a sacrifice? A living sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice, a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to the world, but be transformed. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Um, what is that sacrifice like? Let's look at Psalm 51, where, where David is, is praying his heart out, that he might be one with God again after his great sin. Psalm chapter 51, verses 17 and 19. He says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, that will not despise. And verse 19, then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. You know, the children of Israel anciently saw so much blood. Have you ever wondered why there's so much blood? Every day, at least twice, and then all through the day, sacrifices were offered. Blood was, you know, the priests had quite a job, I imagine, taking care of all, of the, all, this, all this contaminated blood, right? Why so much blood? Because God wants us to know that sin is a very bad thing. It's a devilish thing. And uh, so uh, he says here, then shalt thou be pleased with sacrifices of righteousness. He talks in verse 17 about a contrite spirit. It's the spirit with which those sacrifices are offered. Because our, our great sacrifice is Jesus, right? And he wants us to follow him in this. As we focus on our divine substitute, Jesus Christ, and his shed blood for us, Calvary becomes so immortalized that we too 
will desire to live for God and die continually to sin. Broken spirit, contrite spirit. At one point, God said, I'm not, I've had enough of your sacrifices, but they were given with pride and there was no heart, heart work uh, that had taken place. Dying continually to sin, submission to God and surrender, that's what a living sacrifice does. This is the daily conversion experience. Paul said, I die how often? Daily, every day. Give yourself to God in the morning. When you get up out of the bed, make that your very first work. And that death to self will take place. And the things of earth will become strangely dim as we begin to fellowship with him where he is doing a work for us, ministering with his own blood. Putting ourselves to the altar daily, voluntarily in response to the Holy Spirit, filling our hearts with the love of Jesus so we can go out and do his work. We can, we can resist this daily work, and uh, I'm sure many do, but what we reject is the gospel and grieve the spirit if we don't do this. If we do not resist, we are drawn to the foot of the cross. And I've read someplace that this is the highest point. The foot of the cross? The highest point that we can reach in this life. And sin becomes painful to us when we see what it costs for our salvation. We often say that salvation is a free gift, right? But it costs somebody a lot to get it for us. Now number three. We did number two, and we did number one. Number one was, was uh, holy convocation, camp meeting, right? And what was number two? Yes. Now number three. Now Levitic, back to Leviticus 16 again. Leviticus chapter 16, this time verse 29. We read 30 and... 30 to 32 later, earlier in our scripture reading. But Leviticus chapter 16, verse 29. Here's what it says. And this shall be a statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month and the tenth day of the month, ye shall do what? Afflict your souls. Now that comes up in chapter 23 also. It's what they were asked to do on the day of atonement. Afflict their souls and do no work, whether it be of your own country or a stranger that sojourneth among you. Do no work. Day of atonement. It's a Sabbath rest. It was one of the ceremonial Sabbaths. Seven ceremonial Sabbaths during the Jewish religious year. Day of atonement was one of them. It was the sixth one of the, of the seven. The Sabbath rest is an attitude now, when the weekly Sabbath comes around, we should do the same thing, right? We rest, and it's an attitude. It's an attitude toward God. I'd like to have you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews 4 talks about this in some detail, actually. Hebrews chapter 4, we're just going to read a few of those verses. Hebrews chapter 4, I want to read verse 4 and 9 and 10. Hebrews 4, 4 and 9 and 10. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wife, wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And 9 and 10. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For the, he that entered is he that for he that is entered into his rest. He also ceased from his own works as God did from his. Salvation by faith? Not of works, right? Let's read a passage that we're all familiar with, that we've read a lot here from this desk, and you've read it at home. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. It's after Romans, Corinthians. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. For by grace are you saved through faith. 
Grace is extreme mercy. We have no idea how merciful God really is. Grace is extreme mercy, unmerited by us. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is what does it say? It is a gift. It's a gift of God. If it's a gift, then we don't pay for it, right? We can't pay for it. Somebody comes along. I've used this illustration. Maybe I've used it here. I hope I don't repeat myself too many times in my old age. Somebody gives you a great gift for Christmas. It never comes out of the sky. You, you don't, you've never had that happen before. And then what do you immediately think? Wow, I've got to buy him a gift, right? Then it ceases at that point to be a gift. Not a gift anymore. We can't pay for this gift. In fact, that's not a gift. It says it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Pretty plain language. Can't pay for it. Now verse 10, and people usually stop here at the end of verse 9 and don't read verse 10. That's a bad thing to do. Because it says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. He says, not by works, but then he says, you're created, created unto good works. You're saved from this, and you're saved to this, to good works. Okay. Will those who live by faith and accept this grace have good works in their life? Indeed, they will. This is the fruit. This is the sanctification idea. When we give ourselves to Jesus by faith, by grace through faith, we now have given the Holy Spirit permission to come into our lives and begin to recreate, begin that work of recreation into the image of Jesus, okay, every day that we live. What an idea. Let's finish that verse, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath foreordained that we should walk in them. Salvation by faith, not of works, lest we boast. That's what pride is, right? That's boastful. This is why the sacrifices weren't often, off, weren't often accepted in the Old Testament because it was prideful. Uh, the more blood they saw, they, 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 they sort of became hardened to it. Like we can be hardened to, become hardened to sin. Now Hebrews 4 verse 11. We were just there. Hebrews 4 verse 11. It says, let us labor. I thought we we're not supposed to work. <laughs> let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the example of unbelief. And I'll have to tell you, I, 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 I've struggled with this one for a while, but here's what it, here's what it means. Labor. Let's turn now to John chapter 6, verse 29. John chapter 6, verse 29. And Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God. This is the labor of God. What is it? That ye believe on him whom he hath sent. That's where we spend our time. Studying the word so the faith will be born in our hearts so that that's where the labor should be. So that our faith and trust in Jesus becomes stronger and stronger and our hatred for sin becomes stronger and stronger. Nothing in my hand I bring. Who can finish it? Simply to thy cross I cling. This is the day of atonement attitude. This special kind of Sabbath reform is set forth in Isaiah chapter 58. Now we're familiar with Isaiah 58, aren't we? I'd like to have you turn there to Isaiah chapter 58. This is the Sabbath chapter, by the way. <clears throat> Actually, Isaiah 58 in reality is a Day of Atonement chapter. Isaiah chapter 58. It talks in Leviticus about fasting. But they were fasting, but they were not doing it with a, they were doing it with a prideful heart. Um, they hadn't made that kind of preparation. So Isaiah 58 is set forth in the context of the Day of Atonement. Let's look at verses 12 and 13. 
It says, And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundation of many generations. That's our work, isn't it? As we study the word, we become more familiar with what, you know, in Deuteronomy, or I'm sorry, it's uh, Jeremiah chapter 6, it says, Go in the old paths. Find out what those paths are, because they're all through the Bible. Foundation of many generations, thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honor and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. That's the day of atonement. That's the day of atonement language. As the judgment of the living approaches for the living generation in earth's final generation, a day of atonement style of Sabbath keeping is called for, giving glory to God and taking no human credit. That's what it means to afflict our souls. It means to humble ourselves and uh, in deep repentance. It's a humbling experience, not doing our own pleasure or our own works or thinking our own thoughts or speaking our own words. A breach has been made in God's holy law. The fourth commandment has been neutered and those who live in the end time will restore those paths to dwell in that were, that were um, paths that were followed all through the Old and New Testaments. You know, in the book of Acts alone, there's over, over 80 Sabbaths recorded as, as being kept. 30, 40, 50 years after Jesus went back to heaven. Amazing thing. Sabbath is an attitude that is restored at the end of time so that our Sabbath attitude will be in harmony with the Day of Atonement, not doing our own will, thinking our own thoughts, speaking our own words. Number four, Leviticus 23, 29. Let's go back to Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus 23, verse 29. My fingers somehow don't work as well as they used to. Anybody have that trouble? <laughs> Leviticus 23, verse 29. For whatsoever soul, this is Day of Atonement now, Leviticus 23, for whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, what same day is that? Tenth day of the seventh month, right? For us, it started in 1844, and it's ongoing until the close of human probation. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that day, he shall be cut off from among his people. That's why Day of Atonement was a day of judgment. Afflicting our souls, this Day of Atonement language, literally here it means to abase, humble, lower. Testimonies to Ministers 456 says that the great truth of justification by faith is designed to humble the glory of man in the dust. That's what justification will do. We realize that we give God the glory. That's in the first angel's message, right? It's not of us, it's all of him. As we give ourselves to him, he inspires us with his Holy Spirit to walk in the ways of righteousness, right? But it, we can't put the cart before the horse. What happens if you put the cart before the horse? <laughs> Doesn't work, does it? Humbles the glory of man into the dust. It's a great truth to learn that human works in the room of justification only get in the way. You see how this poor horse has got something in his way now. He's got a cart that's sitting there. Can't do anything with it. There's nothing we can do to raise our stature with God or to increase our acceptance with him. Romans chapter 4, verses 2 to 6. This is a key idea. Romans chapter 4, verses 2 to 6. I know that in some communions I've heard said that salvation is for the Old Testament people, different than it is in the New Testament. But notice this. Two Old Testament characters here in Romans chapter 4, verses 2 to 6. 
It says, for if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to, re- to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was con- counted to him for righteousness. Remember what we read in, in Matthew chapter 6? It said, the work of God is to what? Believe. Believe. That's the work of God. That's how we should labor for it. That's why we should spend some time with him every day. So what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. But to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly his faith is counted for righteousness. And then this other Old Testament character, David. We know about him, don't we? He was a big sinner. Do you believe that? Oh yes, he was. One of the worst ones. But even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Wow. I don't want to be misunderstood here. Having read these clear verses, it's, it is simple truth that when I give glory to God for his work on my behalf, then the only then, then on, only then is the way prepared for the Holy Spirit to reason with my heart and mind, to give me desire to serve God, to work, in, in obedience, to work obedience in me. And when I really get it, I will be so overwhelmed with the goodness of God that I'll be led to repentance. It is the goodness of God that does what? Leadeth to Repentance. When I give my heart to Jesus in a meaningful way, I am a justified believer. What does that mean? It means to be declared righteous, right? Doesn't mean to be made righteous, but to be declared righteous. And God looks at us as though we'd never sinned. That is the beauty of all of this. And my pride will be humble to the dust because I realize that it's him. It's all about him. I'll beg God that I might, in my obedience, be what he all declares I already am in him. That's the motivation, and that's the fruit of justification. Justification is to be declared righteous. Certainly we need this in the Day of Atonement. Don't you think so? More than we ever did before in our lifetimes. It does not mean to be made righteous, but to be declared righteous. When I'm declared righteous in justification, a new birth follows immediately as the Holy Spirit begins to work in my heart and in my life. And obedience springs forth like fruit in a well-watered garden. Want to have that kind of a life? Oh, I'm longing for that kind of a life. Obedience in my heart like a well-watered garden. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. My works do not bring acceptance and salvation, else I could work my way to heaven, and Jesus need not have come. If I depend on that, my debt will only increase. We just read that in Romans 4.4. 4. And we must be careful here. There's a very fine line here. If works enter the room of justification, then we've put poison in the pot. Spiritual pride is the worst kind of pride, lest we boast. And when we give God the glory, who who gets the credit? God does, right? When we give God glory, he gets the credit for our salvation. No room for boasting here. That's why the, the, the glory of man is humbled into the dust when we realize the cost of of the atonement. And that's part of the third angel's message, give God glory. By the way, that's a righteousness by faith idea. Give him the glory? Righteousness by faith, he provides the righteousness. Boy, our time slips away. I'd like to go to Joel too, that's another chapter. Isaiah 58 is a day of atonement chapter and so is Joel too, Joel chapter two. It's Daniel, Hosea, Joel. Joel chapter 2. I want to read verses 12 and 13. I've I've read that Joel 2 was read on the Day of Atonement. 
This is, talks about blowing of the trumpets in Joel chapter 2. It starts out that way. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Calling the people down to the sanctuary where the priest goes in before God for them. Joel chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. And the Lord shall, let's see, 12 and 13. Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting, and with weeping, and mourning, and rend your heart, not your garments. And turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. And 15 and 16, blow the trumpet in Zion, verse 15. Sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the, gather the children, and those that suck the breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth from his chamber, and the bride out of her closet. That's a description of preparation for the Day of Atonement, the judgment of the living, which soon, I believe, none know how soon will take place. These righteousness by faith ideas, and that's, the day, that's what the Day of Atonement is all about. The third angel points to the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Fasting is mentioned here. It was mentioned also in Isaiah 58. There are problems sometimes with our so-called reforms, including fasting. Fasting is not a work of obedience, but it's a humbling of the heart before God. It's not a work. It's a faith-building humbling of the heart. In all this, God wants to create in us new hearts, tender hearts, hearts that love God and our fellow men, unselfish hearts. He wants us to be so surrendered to him that he can write his law on our hearts so that it becomes our law now, one that we take pride and joy and obey so that our motivation will be to love God and to love our fellow men. Romans 13 says, Love is the fulfilling of the law. And Romans 5.5 5 says that it's the Holy Spirit that plants that love in our hearts as we give our hearts to Jesus. All this is called for in our preparation for the Day of Judgment. The judgment began in 1844. And as God is dealing there, with the final disposition of sin, he's serious. And he wants us to be serious about it too. He was serious. He ministers with his own blood. Hebrews 9.12 says that. How much more serious could he get than coming down here, the God of heaven himself, the creator God, coming to this world and shedding his own blood? How much more serious could he get he wants us to be serious, realizing the terrible heinousness of sin which caused the death of his dear son. There is to come the recognition that one cherished sin will neutralize the gospel. What did I say? One cherished sin. We could he turn to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. It calls, it calls it willful sin. This is part of our preparation for the Day of Atonement. Our sins should be going beforehand into judgment. So one willful sin will neutralize the gospel and it makes it possible for, for Satan to take control of the entire mind if it persists because it means that we are grieving the Holy Spirit, not listening to him. This is the reason for so many strong appeals to higher ground in the Bible. God is serious. He wants us to be serious. A habitual commission of known sin silenced the, silences the gospel in our lives. And I don't know how, I've experienced this. Maybe some of you have too. A known sin, go ahead and do it anyway. It's an act of rebellion. And it takes you three or four days to find him again. Just like it was when he went down to the temple that day with his parents. Parents lost sight of, sight of him. It took him, three, it took him three days to find him again. They should have had their eyes on Jesus, right? They were his parents. They knew who he was, but he, got, he slipped away from them. 
took him three days. It says that in Pilgrim's Progress, too. It's that little illustration. On the other hand, this solemn work of preparation does not dis destroy or compromise the joy of the Christian experience. Now, sometimes people get the idea that Christianity is kind of restrictive. It takes away our joy. Does it do that? I want to read a little statement here from Steps to Christ. The character is revealed not by occasional deeds and occasional misdeeds, but by the tendency and the habitual words and acts. Now, uh, in Psalm 51, David shows how the believer's life is a spiral of ever-deepening repentance. Ever-increasing joy as well. The more we gaze upon Jesus, the loveliness of his character, the more we will see our sinfulness and our need of repentance. With every advanced step, our repentance will deepen as we study the word. I want to say that again. With every advanced step, our repentance will deepen. Why will it deepen? Because the closer I come to Jesus, the more faulty will I appear in my own eyes. That, call, that brings repentance, doesn't it? Because we see what, what, what is taking place in our own lives. And the, you know, <laughs> this underscores our need for daily, turning our eyes on Jesus by reading his word and by prayer. Now let's review the four things that we've talked about today. First of all, the call to the sanctuary. Gathering around the sanctuary, camp meeting, if you will. That's what it was anciently. They all came. They're all supposed to come. Secondly, justification by faith alone plus nothing. Let's take that and devour it. It is our hope. Thirdly, Sabbath reform. Sabbath will soon become very important to us as it becomes a test of our loyalty to God. Fourthly, afflict your soul. God wants, God wants us to be in an attitude of humility so that he can restore the lost innocence that we once had in our first parents. So this uh, idea of affliction of soul seems to point us to the specific areas of Christian behavior. Um, we all have the propensity to want to do something for our salvation, right? We want to do. <laughs> we want to pay for the gift. But God, on the other hand, wants, us, wants to create faith in his son so that faith can work out of us what God works in. So there are some things that we can do that will help us in our faith building. Next week, I want to talk about healthful living and the home life. If we live healthfully and our home life is what it should be, guess what? It'll be easier to give ourselves to God because our brain will be more, more awake and we'll be able to uh, discern things we couldn't discern before. The Bible will become a new book because our minds are working better. That's, you know, the brain is connected to the bloodstream, right? <laughs> and if the, brain is, if the blood is not, not pure from ill health, what happens? We, we can't think as well as we should. So um, we're going to talk about that next week. And uh, as we do, we'll be filled with gratitude. Uh, the person who is saved by grace is filled with gratitude and love for Jesus. It's uh, in this setting that I want to talk about those things next week. From our Day of, Day of Atonement Trust brings forth a miracle of new birth and obedience. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, what a blessing it is to know you. You fill our hearts with joy and gratitude every day. You give us those precious promises that are all fulfilled in Jesus so that we can have a good day every day. So I pray, Lord, that as we come down to the close of time, that we might be more ever mindful 
of our need for you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.